All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Proverbs chapter 22. In this chapter, once we get to verse 17, we're going to see the sayings of the wise men. I'll break that down when we get to it. It'll just be a it's a new style introducing here. But we're going to, in this chapter, we're going to talk about the rich and poor and raising children. And we'll just jump right into the first verse. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches loving favor rather than silver and gold. So wealth is going to come in many forms. The wealth of respect and recognize excellence of character, which is a good name, is valuable beyond great riches, right? good reputation. So the man or woman who appreciates the value of a good name, of favor with God and man, recognizes that it's worth more than just silver and gold. Verse 2, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Right, so the difference between the rich and poor appear to be large in the present world. Jesus' story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 highlights these differences. Yet rich and poor do have some things in common. Ultimately, they're all going to be judged by the Lord of Lords. And so those who are rich and those who are poor share the same creator. God's made them all. Both the rich and poor tend to see each other through stereotypes and should remember this towards each other. And people often forget this and make value judgments, but they would do well to treat everybody with respect, and God can easily reduce the rich as raise the poor. Verse 3, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So wisdom doesn't always engage in a fight. It knows there's times when the best response to evil is to hide and let the danger go past. The foolish or the simple man doesn't have the ability to perceive danger and respond correctly. They must endure more evil because of this, and it's something of a punishment. Verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So the two qualities are connected. Humility is a proper view of the self. Fear of the Lord is a proper view of God. And the person who has these two qualities is well on their way on the path of wisdom. And blessing will come to the wise man or woman who has the humility and fear of the Lord. And this is certainly uh, spiritual riches and honor in life. And often those same things materially in this world as well. But not always. Verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. So Proverbs 13 verse 15 told us that the way of the unfaithful is hard. Thorns and snares are symbolically describe a hard way of the perverse. And the metaphor refers to temptations such as easy sex, easy money that are going to tempt the youth. And the morally degenerate tread a dangerous road infested with them. So if you want fewer temptations, change the road that you're on. And so the wise man or woman keeping watch over their life will stay far away from the way of the perverse and the thorns and snares associated with that way. Verse 6, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So a child needs training. The job of a parent is not to simply let him grow up in just any particular way, but to train him in that in the way that he should go. The way that he should go has at least two senses that complement each other. In the sense of the Hebrew, the way that he should go is going to speak of a child's individual way and inclination. This speaks of discerning a child's strength and weaknesses and parenting in a way that takes those into account. And the book of Proverbs often presents the concept of the way, being the path of wisdom and life in contrast to the way of folly and destruction as mentioned in chapter 22, verse 5. And surely this also is the way to train a child in, right? Often the, being a Christian is also to walk in the way. And we can translate it to train up or initiate. It signifies also dedicate or often used as consecrating anything, a house person to the service of God. Dedicate, therefore, in the first instance, your child to God. And nurse, teach, and discipline him as God's child whom he has entrusted into your care. All right, children are a blessing, and it is your stewardship to bring them the right truth in the world and to do this correctly. And this is a wonderful principle that the Holy Spirit may quicken to a promise for parents troubled over their adult children. When a child is trained in the proper way, though they may depart for a season, and perhaps even a long season, in principle they will return and not depart from it. So Solomon's own life displayed that this is a principle and not an absolute promise. 
Other Proverbs will recognize that they use freedom to choose sin in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, and apostize by taking up with villains in Proverbs 2, verses 11 through 15, as well as whores in Proverbs chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And so the book is addressed to youths, not parents, where the parents ultimately responsible for the moral choice, there would be no point in addressing the book to the youth. Moreover, Solomon himself stopped listening to instruction and strayed from the knowledge. All right, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. So, verse 2 told us that there was one important aspect, um, one important respect in which the rich and poor were the same. This proverb is going to remind us of the way they're different. Rich people have more authority and voice in the community than the poor do. The point is, is that one must regard indebtedness only as a last resort and endeavor to get out of debt as rapidly as possible. Debt is debilitating and demoralizing. And those who borrow money are in a lower place than those who lend money. The obvious application of this proverb is that the wise man or woman will do all that, they, that he or she can do to walk in the path of godly prosperity, to be a lender and not a borrower. Verse 8. He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail. So a person's sins are like seeds that are sown. In time, they're going to bring a harvest, and that sinner is going to reap sorrow. And the crop must be according to the seed. And if a man sows thistle seed, it's likely that he shall reap what? And if he sows to the flesh, shall he not reap the flesh to destruction? So the mixing of metaphors from the harvest to the shepherd's rod probably has the idea that in the season when the sinner reaps his harvest from the seeds of iniquity, he will have no defense against it. Verse 9, he who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives off his bread to the poor. So according to this principle, God will bless the one who is generous to others. When people are generous to God and his work, God will not allow them to be more generous than he is. And one important way to express our generosity is to give to the poor and needy. His generosity is simply sharing, for he gives, you know, of his bread. Verse 10, cast out the scoffer, and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. So the scoffer is going to spread cynical discord, causes contention. And when that scoffer is cast out, then the contention leaves. The atmosphere of strife... Uh, and shameful insults stops when the divisive scoffer is gone. And this is going to remind us that an atmosphere of contention, strife, and reproach is caused by people. Verse 11, He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. So inner purity often shows itself through grace-filled words. These, are, these two are marks of godly wise men and women. And so this true godliness and wisdom, both on the inside and and in spoken words will make friends in high places and it will certainly contribute to ongoing fellowship with God for such a person walks in the light as God walks you know in the light first John 1 verses 6 and 7 verse 12 the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge but he overthrows the words of the faithless so God sees, takes note of, and guards those with wisdom and knowledge in this sense it can be said that his eyes preserve knowledge and for the faithless fool, they can expect that God will turn over their words. He will not stand with or support their faithless words. Verse 13, the lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. So this is the cry of the lazy man. In his imagination, the outside world and the work required to function in it are so frightening that it's best avoided. His excuse is crazy and absurd, but such is the refuge of a lazy man. And so this lazy person is represented as finding fantastic and preposterous excuses to demonstrate that there's no idea too odd or fantastic to him to keep him off welfare. His life in the community is not in danger from his phantom lion in the streets, but from his lazy lifestyle. So the lazy man exaggerates the dangers and troubles outside his door, especially those connected with work. You know, and so why does he say so? Because he's a slothful man removes the laziness and these imaginary difficulties and dangers will be no more verse 14 the mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit he who is abhorred by the lord will fall there so this immoral woman often sets her seductive trap by the words she speaks 
Therefore, her mouth is a trap leading to death. Solomon knew something of this danger because he saw his father David fall into a deep pit of immorality. And so, God's wise ones are discerning enough to stay clear of the deep pit, but the fool who is abhorred by the Lord is likely to fall there. Verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So children are not born as morally neutral beings. There is a moral problem, described as foolishness, that is bound up in the heart of a child. And it's evidenced by the fact that our children will naturally sin without being taught how to do it. And parents will attest to this. And this is our nature that's inherited from our ancient ancestors, Adam and Eve. And so the father must not underestimate the difficulty of his task, for he's going to battle with an innate uh, perversity here, and he has to tear down and build up to eradicate and implant. So physical discipline is one important way that a child can be morally trained. Uh, when wisely and properly applied, physical correction can help drive away a child's inborn foolishness. So discipline will remove a child's bent to folly. The child is morally immature. The training must suppress folly and develop potential. And I'm not talking about abuse here. I'm talking about correction. Verse 16, He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. So there's always those who prey upon their unfortunate fellow man and will oppress the poor to increase his riches. The one who gives to the rich is like the one who oppresses the poor. He has no compassion for those in need and he will surely come to poverty. God's blessing will not be on the life and wealth of such a man lacking in compassion. And so we get a juxtaposition here of one who takes money from the poor who needs it and the one who gives to the rich who does not need it points up to folly, right? For example, it happens when executives are paid exorbitant sums and overwork their remaining employees. So now we're coming to another section it's words of the wise. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17, is going to begin a new section of the collection of Proverbs. We're going to move from the long section containing almost entirely two-phrase wisdom sayings with very little arrangement according to the theme or context. But starting here, the structure of the wisdom sayings is often longer and they are more arranged according to, this, uh, to some theme. And so... This section, a lot of commentators will think it starts here at chapter 22, verse 17, and it's going to end at chapter 24, verse 22. Proverbs 22, verse 20 uses the phrase, I have written to you 30 excellent things, and it's likely that Solomon patterned this section after the Egyptian wisdom writing, um, a minimo, finding 30 wisdom sayings in this section. And there's also a point that Solomon used some of the structure of Amenonope's to arrange this section but not the content of the ancient Egyptian writing. So the first part is introduced as the sayings of the wise. The second part is introduced by the statement, these are the sayings of the wise. Uh, the section is going to include 20 instances in which two verses express a complete thought rather than one verse as in you know the previous chapters. Also, my son's going to occur five times, whereas it occurs 15 times in the first nine chapters and only once in chapter 10 and twice in the remainder of the book. So the instruction of a minimope, uh, the first portion includes 30 sayings, as does a similar Egyptian work. Some scholars will suggest that the wise man borrowed from an Egyptian work. If this work was written five or six hundred years before Christ, its date is still later than Solomon's time. Uh, from 971 to 931 BC, and it's later than Hezekiah's reign from 715 to 686 BC. But we will see that Scripture is divinely authorized in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So let's just jump right into it. We'll take verses 17 through 21. The value of the words of the wise. So incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips, so that you, your trust may be in the Lord. I have instructed you today, even you. 
and have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you so another invitation to receive words of wisdom unless one's heart and mind are ready to receive wisdom it does little good to present it there should be conscience readying of mind and heart to receive so the value of gaining and keeping wisdom is pleasant sometimes we feel the way of wisdom is difficult path to walk but it's much more pleasant than the way of the fool and to keep them within you the hebrew that's in thy belly or in thine heart and the excellent things are going to be a reference to thirsty um, is significant or 30 sorry the reference to 30 and so true wisdom is going to make us more dependent on god not less we grow in our trust in the lord realizing that the pursuit of wisdom begins and continues with a proper view of god and so i've instructed you today even the most brilliant moral sayings are powerless without personal application today refers to each day of the son's life because he is to have all of them always ready on his tongue <clears throat> so the pursuit of wisdom makes us more confident in the truth not less certainly wisdom discovers that some things are more complicated and doubtful but in general it sees god and his truth with more clarity and certainty all right verse 22 and 23 treat the four fairly fairly do not rob the poor because he is poor nor oppress the afflicted at the gate for the lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them so the poor among us deserve more protection and compassion even if one is poor because of their moral failings or foolish behavior they should still not be taken advantage of and robbed and so even if the rich rob the poor they still have a defender god himself is going to plead their cause and is going to plunder the soul of those who plunder the poor understanding god's concern for and protection of the poor wisdom is going to lead us to treat them honorably and the poor can't defend themselves with great resources and influence and so the rich man's treatment of the poor says a lot about the rich man's character verse 24 and 25 the warning of an angry man make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man do not go lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul so a person who often can't control their anger displays bad character and can be a dangerous companion wisdom chooses friends carefully and should make no friendship with an angry man and so unless unless you learn his ways and this is one of the important reason why it's foolish to make a friendship with an angry man his habits are going to influence yours and you're going to become more like an angry person and it's going to set a trap for your soul we are influenced by the habits of our friends so choose friends carefully verse 26 and 27 stay away from the debts of others do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge one of those who is surety for debts if you have nothing with which to pay why should he take away your bed from under you so as mentioned in the other proverbs it's a dangerous thing to become responsible for the debts of other people personal debt is to be avoided so how much more becoming surety of debts for another person so under the laws and customs regarding the failure to pay debts in the world of the bible property could be easily seized and people could be made to be forced servants for repayment of debts so don't don't take on debts of other people verse 28 respect ancient ways and wisdom right do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set so from the days when joshua divided the promised land for the people of israel there were landmarks showing the boundaries of property and it was a very great crime and scandal to remove those landmarks and the boundaries were sacred because god owned that land and had given it to their fathers as an inheritance so to extend one's land at another's expense was a major violation of covenant and an oath and deuteronomy will say unless you covet a curse in deuteronomy 27 know that property is god's ordinance in acts chapter 5 and psalm 17 so we also understand this proverb in a spiritual sense a landmark a custom tradition or value should not be removed lightly we should never assume that our fathers set such landmarks for no reason or a bad reason we should not defend tradition for the sake of tradition but neither should we destroy tradition just for the sake of destroying it verse 29 the reward of excellent work do you see a man who excels in his work he will stand before kings he will not stand before unknown men so wisdom pushes us towards excellent god's 
given every man and woman work to do, and they should do that work with excellence to God and not only to men. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. And the excellence of a man or woman's work can give them great standing in the world. More importantly, it gives them standing before God himself, who promises to reward the one who works diligently to him in Colossians chapter 3. So Jesus taught that the one who is trustworthy in the small matters of this world will be entrusted with ten cities in his coming kingdom in Matthew 25 verses 14 through 30, Luke chapter 19 verses 11 through 27, and John chapter 12 verse 26. All right, that covers chapter 22. Next time we'll take chapter 23. Thank you for joining me.